25 verse 15 tonight, which reads, By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Now, when I read this verse for the first time, I, as of starting to prepare this, I thought, what? Usually these verses go together, right? There's a parallelism between the first part and the second part. And as we dig into it, I trust and I hope we'll see that it is saying the same thing, even though the second half is a little bit more figurative in its presentation. But before we get there, by way of introduction, I'd like you to, let's just sort of brainstorm together for a minute. I'd, I'd plan to, to have the kids answer these questions. You guys get to be kids tonight. But what are things in creation that are loud? What are things that are loud in, in creation? Okay, a thunder, thunderstorm, or a, th a thunderstorm, no, a, th a, a Clap of thunder, and it certainly can be loud if you're near it. All right, what else? Peacocks squawking. What? Peacocks squawking at night. Peacocks squawking at night. Uh, I'm happy to report that's not a problem we have in Port St. John's. But okay, what else? Somebody else said something. Lightning. Lightning. All right, if you're close enough to lightning, it, it makes a bang. That's very true. What else? Roseanne? All right, great falls, uh, falling water, especially at great distance. Uh, now, now that starts to get us into a different category. Pretty much everything we've named so far is instant, quick, boom. Uh, if you go to Niagara and you stand in the falls at 60% or whatever they have it turned down to, you can't hear anything else. What else is, is a sustained noise like that? Tornadoes. Anybody ever been in or, t or tornado? I mean, been in it. You've been direct hit. Barbara has, Pat has. They say it sounds like a freight train coming at you. There has been one time in 13 years when I was in my study and I thought I heard a freight train coming at me. I don't think I've ever told this story. I got under my desk for a little bit and just waited. It turned out probably to be nothing. There was no damage, but you know, that's that, that real sustained noise and we can I think imagine the intensity of that um, what else there's two others on my list I'll give them to you how about an earthquake is an earthquake loud what does an earthquake sound like I don't I didn't know either so I googled Google knows everything and I found this website, Recording of Earthquakes. And all of these recordings were really old, so not really high fidelity. But, but it was interesting. It is like this moaning sound that, that happens. And you can imagine what would go with the, the quaking of the earth and, and the, the shaking of the earth and the tearing of the earth. That's certainly not something we necessarily think of, but something that's there. Ron, Kathy, at the same time. So well, the earthquake we had in o o Ohio sounded like a... Okay. It sounded like a dump truck picked up about 10 feet and dropped on the street. And it, was it just like instant? It wasn't, it wasn't sustained, though? Okay, that, that's interesting. Yeah. When I was in with the state, my parents were running around thinking that the uh, furnace had blown up. Wow. And I, that would depend on location and all these things. So where were you at, Becky, when that happened? In Collingswood. Oh, they have earthquakes in Collingswood? Yeah. They, they did. They, that's right. They did. All right, I saw another hand. Bill? I was thinking of a volcano. All right, volcano. Imagine Mount St. Helens went up and made a pretty good noise. Probably. So the other one on my list is sort of on that theme is, is fire. You know, real roaring fire. Now, does anybody have any idea why am I mentioning, when we're looking at Proverbs 25, verse 15, why are we talking about a tornado, an earthquake, and fire as being loud? You click? 
direct opposite, and I'm thinking of Elijah the prophet. Remember when he was in the cave? After he, he enters this time of depression, and the Lord's ministering to him, he's taking a nap in the cave. He comes out of the cave, and what passes by? The whirlwind, the tornado. And then, and then an earthquake. And then the fire. But the Lord wasn't in any of those things. He was in a still, small voice, which sometimes we think about that and we, we interpret that in this way. Like, oh, the Lord speaks to me privately. The, the idea being there that the voice of the Lord was, was in a low whisper. And we think, we tend to think that loud noises give something authority, but there's an intensity that can happen with a low whisper that, uh, you know, we... My, my tendency when one of the kids has uh, having a meltdown, you guys maybe not know this, my, my kids have meltdowns, okay? Um, but uh, they'll be having a meltdown, and my temptation is to try and speak over them volume-wise, which doesn't seem to work. But then I'll it's remember, no, 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 and I'll get right in their ear, and I'll whisper, and I'll lower my voice with with an intensity, and I'm not saying please, 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 but I'm, I'm instructing them in a low voice, and all of a sudden, that now, you know, for whatever reason, there's this dynamic where they quiet down and, and they have to, to listen. You know, the voice of the Lord is powerful, and we know that. The Bible clearly says that in, in so many places, but we often think about power and, and volume and almost intimidation, but there's a, this intensity that can come through the whisper. And the, the other side of it, have you ever seen two people communicate well when they're shouting at each other? Have you ever seen, uh, have you watched any recent videos of somebody giving a lecture on a college campus on usually it's some conservative, at least what YouTube serves me, some conservative is talking about some issue of the day, transgenderism, abortion, homosexuality, the authority of the Bible, and they'll be talking and somebody will get up to ask a question and will just try and shout them down. Not a lot of communication, not a lot of understanding, not a lot of progress is made in those situations. And a lot of times a person just sort of waits it out or tells them or they end up having to be escorted out. You know, our verse tonight is all about persuasion. It's about persuasion. It's about communication and it's about getting a point across and getting someone to agree with us. And fundamentally, that's what we do, for instance, when we're sharing the gospel with somebody. We're trying to help them understand and help them get it. And so there, there's just two points that I have. Number one, don't give up. And number two, don't give in. So first, don't give up. And that's the first half of the verse that says, By long forbearing is a prince persuaded. So first off, a prince. A prince is a ruler. Like some translations, it's, it's literally the word prince, but some translations have ruler. But, you know, a prince is someone who's in authority effectively by birth. Right? It, it, you know, unlike politicians today, politicians, we always sort of wonder if they're just saying what we want to hear because they have to get reelected. Right? Where, where our republic turns more into democracy at that point because ultimately they are accountable to the electorate and the, the electorate could, could vote them out. Well, princes, and one of the, the inherent problems with a monarchy is it's not based upon merit, but is based upon uh, heredity. So here you have somebody who's in authority and their authority is not dependent upon you but yet they have authority, and in some ways they have a lot of authority. And as we read about a person in authority, we're told that he can be persuaded. 
that he, he can be persuaded. A, a prince, a man in authority, can be persuaded. You can help them understand and, and show them a point. Maybe it's a, you're, you're presenting a plan of action, and you're trying to communicate that to them, and you have to get them to agree. This verse is telling us it's possible to persuade them. But notice what it says. They won't be persuaded quickly. It says, by long forbearance. The literal word is with length. All over a long period of time, with, with much discussion. One of the things that I found so fascinating, usually when somebody presents a plan, somebody else rejects it, and then when things sort of devolve from there, the person who presented the plan assumes that the person just didn't understand. And so they come about it and they, they do something that's sort of crazy. They say the exact same thing over again and expect the person to understand the second time. And they don't change, they don't try and, and explain it any further, they just, and it becomes this battle of one versus the other over the same thing over and over again. Last night, I was trying to help Micah and by extension Bethany with a math problem. It was an inequality. And it, it, it said 6x plus 9x is greater than, I don't remember what the other side was. And I was trying to help them figure out how to combine that first side, which seemed really obvious to me but was not so obvious to them. And I tried everything I could think of to, as we, we had playing cards in front of us and tried to, to use that as an example. Finally, I, I made a, an observation after a long period of time of saying it a different way. And Mike goes, oh, I see what you're saying. Now the temptation is just to say the same thing over and over again, right? Not change anything, not try and explain it. That's not what this verse is saying. What this verse is saying with over, with length, over time, that the prince can be persuaded. You know, we, we don't give up. We continue to persevere, to instruct and exhort and encourage. You, you think about uh, if you've ever taught anyone to do anything. Susan, you taught school for how long? 30 years. Just 30 years. In this crowd, that's not a very long period of time. But in 30 years, how many students got everything perfect the first time? Did you ever have a true prodigy? No, I don't think so. Because right. I've had some that were pretty close. Yeah. In, in math. In, in math. Pretty, pretty close in math. They were almost as good as me. <laughs> That's a joke. But um, um, and didn't you teach some of your, your uh, nieces and nephews? Yep. Were they prodigies? <laughs> Anna's shaking her head really big, but well, and, <laughs> she, she was the prodigy. But anyways, you know, nobody, even a prodigy, doesn't get everything the first time. And in all areas. What, Roseanne? And not in all areas. And, and not in all areas. You know, how many times, you know, you think about Matthew 18 for a second, where it says, if somebody sins against you, somebody's offended you, you're to go to them and you're to tell them their faults between you and them privately. And how many times do we do that one time, somewhat half-heartedly, they don't agree with us and then we say, oh, I did what I was supposed to do, and then we just give up. It's interesting, the text in Matthew 18 says when they refuse to hear you. It could be one time, it could be two times, it could be three times. And it's, it's surprising sometimes how quickly we give up on someone, how quickly we stop the, the conversation, how quickly we write somebody off. And yet the Bible tells us while there's breath, there's hope. The Bible tells us that we're tools in the hands of God, so we're doing what we can always in prayer and always looking to the Lord and always hoping in the Lord to work, that we are to not give up. But the second one, the second half of the verse, I shouldn't say but, and the second half of the verse is don't give in. And this is where the verse gets a little bit odd, right? A soft tongue, a soft tongue breaketh the bone. And 
it, but don't sticks and stones break the bones, but words will never hurt me. Did, did that go through anybody else's head when they first uh, read this verse, or was that just me? Uh, but the idea here is that uh, what's a broken bone? A broken bone produces weakness, or you can think about it in the context here, the removal of resistance. Um, uh, we, we have experienced our first broken bone in, in the house, and uh, that arm, his left arm, is virtually useless. Uh, he was trying to help me make my, my coffee this morning, and uh, just couldn't get the lid off, couldn't, you know, it, it, he's got the right arm that's working, but it, it, God gave us two arms for a reason, and when one's not working right, this is not working. When you have a broken leg, you, you can't, can't move as you want. So, so the imagery is, is producing a weakness, or think about it this way, even removing the resistance, that through soft words, we can break down that resistance, and then the prince is persuaded that it's not a shouting match, that it's not the, through intimidation, but it is through words of truth, words of communication, words that lead to understanding. I thought to myself as I saw this word soft here, I said, this will be really great. We'll do a word study in the book of Proverbs on this particular word. We've done this several times in our study of Proverbs. It's often very fruitful. So I pull up the software, type in the word soft, go to the book of Proverbs. You know how many times this word comes up in Proverbs? Twice. I was really disappointed. Anybody know the other one? Yeah. Do you know the reference? I wouldn't have remembered it either, but I cheated. I looked it up. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. These two, these verses go together. And, and we talked about how soft words, not only what we say, gentle words, but also the, the, the volume, the intensity, the way, the tone that we say it goes into that as well. And it can turn away wrath. If in essence, what we're reading about in Proverbs 25, 15, it can bring understanding. These are words that are mild. They're gentle words. There is the idea of continuing to, to reason as we're talking with the person. And when I say don't give in, the, the idea that I'm driving at is that we wouldn't fall into the trap of the world's way of doing things. And there's a lot of places that we could turn. I'm going to just turn over to James chapter 3. You'd think this Bible would open to James a little bit better than it is. But James chapter 3, when he's talking about wisdom, he says the wisdom that descends not from above is earthly, sensual, devilish. That's the worldly wisdom. That's the worldly way of doing things. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That the wisdom from above is gentle. It is, King James says, easy to be entreated. I learned it as open to reason, is full of mercy and has got good fruits. You know, beloved, that's the way we're to present the gospel. That's the way we're to stand for the faith. That's the way we're to live our faith. That we... Don't give in to the way of the world. You know, I was, I was thinking about it. And I don't remember why I was thinking about it. But, you know, Christianity is really unique in the history of world religions. Because Christianity has thrived, true Christianity, I mean, biblical Christianity. Christianity has thrived when it's been oppressed by the powers that be. And when it's the powers that be... Uh, have accepted Christianity, we've, ha we've actually had more problems in those situations within the church than when there's been persecution and when there's been opposition or when the government's just, just stayed out of it. That's not the, normally the way it works. In, in world religions, the false religions, 
Somebody in power has to prop it up and has to promote it and has to do it. And I was thinking about like the gods of the Egyptians. We're, they're nowhere today. The, the, the Greek and Roman gods, those aren't, aren't worshipped anymore. They, they were defeated. Yet Christianity, there's no army promoting Christianity in the world. And yet, it still exists. It will always exist. Because Jesus will build his church, not with worldly means, but with his heavenly means. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so, even a soft word has the power to break bones. A kind word can, can turn away wrath. A kind word and, and an act of loving kindness can keep coals of fire on our enemy's head. And so we're called to the battle. So I would make these two observations. Number one, do not give up. God still saves today. The gospel still saves lives today. The word of truth, the gospel of our salvation in which we believed is still the call of the church, is still the message of the church, and still saves today. And then secondly, do not give in. Related to the doctrine of inerrancy, the doctrine of inerrancy says our Bibles are without error. That if they speak to a, a, a Anything that speak to, to history or to geography, they, they speak with precision and they're true. But related to that doctrine is another one that's just as important, and that is the sufficiency of Scripture. The world, or excuse me, I one too many letters. The word is sufficient. It's still sufficient for us today. We don't have to go out there. We don't have to do things the way of the world. We don't have to do things the way others do. We're not uh, entertainment promoters. We're not having to convince people through uh, manipulation. It's the Word of God. And it's powerful in our lives. You know, as your neighbors and your coworkers and your unsaved family observe you over a long period of time, May they, by the grace of God, by the power of the Spirit of God working in our lives, may they see a difference in us. A difference that, why do you have hope? Why do you have peace? Why do you have joy? And may we be ready with an answer. An answer that points them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is sufficient. We thank you for the message of the gospel. We thank you that it still saves.